Well, first of all, thank you to the organizers and thanks for having me. Uh, as was stated in the introduction, I'm the director and principal investigator of an international research consortium that's called CONCIV. And the, what, what we mostly do in that research group is trying to put a monetary value and, on goods and services that matter a lot to us, but generally are not traded in markets and thus they don't have a price. So what we actually do in that research group is to try to put a price on things that we usually call priceless. Um, I was going to start my talk with an attention-grabbing story, just like Georgina did, and you often do in talks like this. But we've learned a lot uh, during those seminars that we've already had. And one thing that we learned yesterday from, uh, actually from our comedians, and I really took to heart, they really called for more animal pictures. <laughs> so that's why I decided to swap out my attention-grabbing story <laughs> and introduce Alvia and Concordia. So, but back to the topic. So what I wanted to do is, uh, I wanted to talk about whether we could, and maybe also whether we should, monetize things that are dearest to us. It can be really uncomfortable sometimes to try to say what something is worth that you usually talk about as priceless. Um, so basically, uh, I'm gonna follow up on a lot that uh, uh, was said yesterday by one of our uh, main speak speakers, Richard Layard. He was really calling for, uh, or talking about the importance of a single measure to measure things, well-being. Uh, I really understand and why we do, a lot of countries use dashboards, like we've done in Iceland. We have like 40 indicators of well-being. Uh, but there's a problem with using those dashboards because trying to maximize well-being in society involves trade-offs. You have to decide, okay, we want this type of well-being. We have to work toward it. It's gonna cost us leisure. So how much is our leisure time worth compared to that? Or to do something else, we have to draw on, on our uh, natural resources. How much is the environment worth? And on those dashboards, we don't have that. We just have to say, we got a little bit more of this, a little bit less of that. We would like to have more of everything, but those trade-offs are difficult. So that's why a single measure can be really uh, important when we're trying to value all those things. So if we're trying to maximize well-being, we've talked a lot uh, about aggregate measures. Like we talked about GDP quite a bit. And everybody knows that that doesn't capture all that, that, uh, that is important to us. Uh, but we have other indicators. We have the, uh, the GPI, for example. We could just measure happiness, is what some people have said. But uh, we also need to go beyond those aggregate measure and try to uh, maximize well-being at the micro level. Because even if we think, darn it, it's really difficult to measure this at the aggregate level, we know that what we want we want to increase well-being overall. Maybe we can't do that, but we know that the way to increase well-being in society is so that every time you make a decision, you make it so that you make sure that the well-being that you get is more than the well-being that you sacrifice. At the micro level, so if you do take, make one decision he here and the well-being is greater than what was sacrificed, then you're increasing well-being. Next decision, let's evaluate whether the well-being that we're getting is greater than the well-being that we're sacrificing. That's cost-benefit analysis. You're measuring costs against benefits. Uh, so that's at the micro level. So even if we didn't have an aggregate measure that's good enough, we also, we know that we have to do this every step of the way. Uh, and that means that when we're doing those cost-benefit analyses, we need to take into account things that uh, we value a lot. So, but if we go back to the GDP, uh, a lot of, uh, since its inception within economics, there has been a lot of uh, work on, on, on well-being. People here yesterday, several people quoted Adam Smith, who is generally considered the, the father of modern economics. 
and cited things from his book, uh, The Wealth of Nation, which showed how important that goal was to him, increasing well-being. Um, I want to quote here uh, Simon Kuznets, who is often talked about as the founding father, some would say, or the initiator of GDP. And although he's not really the one who initiated it, he later got the Nobel Prize because he's, he was an amazing economist and a, and a great statistician and econometrician. And he wrote a report and he really formalized the way that GDP would be uh, captured. And he, in that report that started all of this, he actually said, the welfare of nations can scarcely be inferred from a measurement of national income as defined above. So we start this measure and we've known from the beginning it has its shortfalls in this way. So that's why over the years that have followed, people have been trying to adjust that measure in many different ways and trying to find other types of measurements to, to capture well-being. Uh, it started maybe, I think, one of the first things to appear was uh, the creation of green national accounts. That was national accounts that took the environment into consideration and so forth. Uh, but like was said before, all of these can be quite flawed. Some people would say, why don't we just measure happiness, as Georgina was talking about. But that has serious issues also. Uh, so, because we, I mean, we know a lot about this. I think we have to learn from what we know and make sure that we don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater, that we understand that um, even though I really understand how capturally, how conceptually and intuitively um, enticing it is to just measure happiness, it comes with other problems. And actually, many of the problems that we have with GDP would still remain. The, um, a subtitle of this conference is in the Wellbeing Economy Forum now is sustainability. Because some people have argued GDP has a problem when it comes to the environment. We live in you know, the four-year election cycle, and it's very tempting when you have a measure of well-being that people use as a measure of well-being, that's the GDP, for politicians to not be careful of the environment in order to raise GDP, because people's eyes are on the GDP. So it's tempting to do things that maybe sacrifice environment to raise GDP. But the thing is that even if we were using happiness, that problem would not be solved. If we say, okay, we're gonna throw out GDP, we're gonna measure happiness. We can do that also for short-term gains in happiness. So the way that this can be damaging for the environment, other measures can also do that. So we have to be really careful. So that's why, for example, uh, the genuine progress indicator that I mentioned here, GPI, that's a measure that uses the GDP, but then monetizes the value of other goods and services and adjusts it. So say, okay, we have increased unsafety. How much is that worth? We did increase in terms of GDP, but we have to subtract a substantial amount because of the increased violence. And we also maybe got something else that's of value that's not captured in the GDP. So we have those types of, of measures out there uh, that we could utilize. Um, so that's at the aggregate level, but like I say, even if we haven't decided what's the best measure to use at the aggregate level, we can still work at the micro level and decide is more sacrifice for less? Try to evaluate if more is sacrifice for less. So I wanted to, uh, so if you think about, just put yourselves in the situation, it's the start of COVID. You're put on a policy team that's supposed to decide what to do. You know, the air is reeked with uncertainty, but what you know already is that this virus is especially harmful for the elderly. And you're trying to decide should we put a visitation ban in retirement homes, or should we not? You have to weigh the benefits against the costs. Now, often when you do this, it's not that difficult. Most of the benefits and costs are easily quantifiable. 
But what are the benefits and costs here? There are some benefits and costs that are easily quantifiable. You need to, need to maybe change the staffing a little bit and stuff like that. But basically, that's nickels and dimes. What you're really doing is you're buying health and you're buying life, which is difficult to measure. And how are you paying for it? You're paying for it with social relations. So here's a trade-off that if you're going to do a cost-benefit anal analysis, if you don't want to just do it, just throw a penny, you better have something that can measure those things in a comparable way. And that's why one single type of measurement is so valuable, so that you're able to measure those things uh, and compare them to each other on one measurement. So this is not a hypothetical sample. Of course, we know that all countries were doing this. When that was being done, authorities contacted us in my research group, and, they, uh, and we did an analysis. And uh, so this is the result of that. For the first, for the first wave, uh, how much, so we measured the value of people's social relations. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think a single visit was worth for the for the residents, was worth around $165, substantially less for the people visiting. I think it was around $40. And so if the visit, and we knew how many peop, visits people were getting and so forth, so we could quantify, quantify this. And so here you can see the number of lives saved and the costs. So one line shows the costs and the other the benefits. So we here have quantified the benefits of the health and the benefits of the social relations. And we can see here the dotted line is the value of the expected life that we're saving. And harsh as it may is, this has taken into account that the life years that we're saving in each case, it's not that many life years. And it has also been taken into account that, you know, maybe, you know, in, in this analysis, in, in, in the work that we did, that the quality of life is not necessarily superb. Uh, and then we have the other line, so we have the value of social relationships. So if you take away social relationships with family and loved ones by all these people, and you only save one life, that's a lot of cost for not so much benefit. And then if you save two lives, then you're spreading the cost over two people, and you've already cut down the cost a lot per life. And we found that the break-even point was at 6.25, 29 lives. So if we were saving more lives than this during the first, uh, first wave, then it was worth it. The value was greater than the costs. And we, I mean, everybody who was involved in this in any way knows that during that wave, we surely saved more. When we didn't have vaccinations, we didn't have a lot of good treatments. But then over time, a visitation ban would save fewer and fewer people as we have other measures. Uh, so this is, just, uh, this is just one example of, of how this is done with cost-benefit analyses. So, um, so this would be a cost-benefit analysis. What many people in here may be more familiar with are cost-effectiveness analyses. Uh, and Richard Laird, he mentioned those. Uh, a type of cost-effectiveness analysis is the cost-utility analysis, and that is when you measure the cost per, for example, quality-adjusted life year. So that's a cost-benefit analysis, one type of cost-effectiveness uh, analysis. So the cost-effectiveness is just if you measure cost against some type of effectiveness. So for example, if you say the cost per life, that is cost-effectiveness. But if you say cost per life that has been adjusted for the health-related quality of life, then you have a utility measure, like a well-being measure. It's not just life, it's the well-being within that life that's also being captured, and that becomes a cost-utility analysis. And, and uh, Richard, he mentioned this cost-utility analysis as an example of the success of something that has a single measure because uh, the benefits of cost uh, utility analyses are that it has 
Health is so many way, many things, but it captures all of those things in a one dimension. It says, okay, in the healthcare system, we're buying all kinds of stuff. Sometimes we're buying relief from pain, or we might be buying more mobility, or we might be buying an extension of life. So we have to be able to compare this in a single way. The pain, how much is that worth compared to mobility? And that's what the quality adjusted life years do. And it's because we have a single measure that this has been successful within the healthcare system because then you can say, I want a well-being healthcare system. I want to maximize well-being. How do I do that? I spend my money where I can get the most well-being. Here I can get a quality adjusted life year for 10 million Icelandic kroner. Here I can get it for 100 million. If I only have a set amount of uh, a set budget, I try to spend it where I can get the most well-being with per dollar spent. So those are the pros that it's, it, it works well if you want to maximize well-being. The concerns, which were also pointed out by Richard, is that this only puts health-related things on one dimension. So you can only prioritize within the healthcare system. You cannot say, okay, we are thinking of uh, initiating this type of vaccination. How does that compare to three new daycare systems or a new bridge or a culture house? You can only prioritize because it only takes the different dimensions of health into one, uh, into one measurement. But uh, it does not capture other things, so that's what you need cost-benefit analysis. You need to like monetize everything in order to, in order to be able to do a full-blown cost-benefit analysis that also takes you know, untangible goods uh, into consideration. So the question is, could we uh, and should we uh, monetize what's dearest to us? So uh, I'm gonna just try to answer the could we by the simple fact that we have done it a lot. So at least we've tried. Some people might argue that we don't do it well enough. Some people might do that it's fantastic. But like Georgina said, many types of measures have their, have their problems. So it's more like a matter of how well we can do it, not whether we can do it or if it's possible. And I can just take a few examples from my own research group to, to demonstrate this. So a few recent papers. Here is, this is not the residential home study. This is a different study that was actually also prompted by, uh, by the Ministry of Finance, information that they were seeking. That was the, the willingness to pay, which is actually the, the value for escaping COVID-19 related social restrictions. So how much are we hurting people by putting a cap on how many people can gather? How much are we hurting people by requiring them to stay two meters apart and monetizing that? Uh, this is another here from, since February, uh, a study about measuring the value of uh, psychosocial factors at work. We've also done just general uh, health. Here are 34 health conditions. In this study, 18 health conditions. Uh, depression and anxiety, pain. How much is it worth not to suffer long-term pain? Um, problematic alcohol use. Uh, and this is because also here we are trying to value uh, the severity of the health condition and for how long you've had it because the value your, your pain and suffering might be different in the beginning versus as time passes. Maybe in the sense that you've gotten used to the condition and you don't suffer as much because you've learned to live with it. Or maybe it becomes more frustrating with some conditions over time. Uh, informal care, uh, body mass index, and so forth. So, so this has been done, and this is not to say that this is the only thing, it's just easy for me to make examples from my own research group, but this is being done uh, all over the world. 
So many people might, might think, okay, this is, this is a little insane to try to put a price on pain. Like, how do we really do this? I mean, how do we just uncover what's in people's heads? Is that even possible? So there are a few methods. Uh, some involve questions, it's, but it's difficult to just ask people. But there are methods where you ask people to state their preferences. They have their limitations like all methods, because it's conceptually very difficult for people to wrap their minds around this. It's like, you want me to value having a close friend? How, how can I do that? So it's, so it's very difficult. Uh, and then there are you know, uh, natural experiments where we try to find situations where people's preferences are reeled, revealed somehow automatically. Some might say, if you want to see how much is it worth for people to have pets? If you would take me as an example, you would say, well, by the amount of blueberries and dried cod and toys and stuff that she buys for her pets, it's worth a lot to her. So some would say that that's a measure of revealed preferences. People try to search for things where people actually show it with their behavior. What we mostly do in my research group, we use the compensating income variation method. And that is, uh, it can, of course, it's tricky methodologically, but the concept is not very difficult. So I want to just explain it a little bit because I think it's easier for people to understand how this is actually possible if you, if you see the concept behind this. So basically, we try to measure. Let's take the example of pain. And we, if we try to measure for the statisticians in here and econometricians and, you know, those who work with numbers, let's just set causality aside for a second and believe us when we say that we try to measure this causally. We say, okay, how much, is, how big is the effect of pain on satisfaction with life or on happiness, on some well-being measure? Because that's the ultimate goal. We want to try to maximize well-being, maximize happiness. How big is that effect of pain? And let's say that we are able to measure that. We know the size of that effect. And then we also measure what's the size of the effect of income on happiness. If we know the size of both effects, we can say, okay, if I had the average person, I snapped my finger and gave them pain, how much money would I also need to give them for them to be equally happy? How much would I need to compensate them to adjust for that hit to their happiness that the pain gave them. It's a little bit like people can also think about it as how much would you need to compensate people for pain and suffering in the judicial system? You know, if something happens to you, your house burns down, you're compensated for the direct financial damage. But if you have, if you are, for example, victimized by a violent act, the damage is mostly pain and suffering. And how much is that pain and suffering? How much would you need to be compensated to counter that? So that's basically how uh, the methods that we use to capture this. So, so I think, hope that that answers the question whether it's possible. It's done. So in that sense, it's possible. And then the question is, should we do it? And I would argue that if we want evidence, an evidence-based well-being economy, rather than just trying to imagine whether we think one thing is more important than the other, if we're trying to quantify the well-being, then, uh, then it's important. So in conclusion, we could monetize the value of things dearest to us. I know that because we already do. And if we're interested in a well-being economy, then we also should. Thank you. Thank you.